says it's live on YouTube. Like the Zoom just told me it's live on YouTube. What is it with the middle of the day? <laughs> All right. It says we're streaming on both. I see nothing on my end though. Let me refresh. I see Twitch. Ah, yes. Yeah, okay. Twitch is there. All right. Okay. And I don't see YouTube yet. Still waiting on YouTube though. Is there? Um It is super irritating because we've been here before. <laughs> okay, well, let me edit the. Let's see if I can do this. No. I feel like instead of like a starting soon screen, we need like a like a my irritated face screen yeah well you know i just don't understand like why everything seems fine everything seems like yeah, it's Zoom right literally telling me that we're streaming on youtube yeah there we are okay irritated face nope. yep all right okay. so mine is still not showing but actually well i'm watching i'm watching it It is, it is there. All right. Well, you keep an eye on that. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and watch <laughs> you on, uh, on my Twitch. All right. So hi guys. <laughs> if it isn't a technology problem, you know, it's not us co-streaming. So what, uh, you know what? I feel like it, it's in line with it's 300 degrees outside. I, in order to keep my skin on, it's pinned to the back of my head. <laughs> and I have double electrolytes. Yes, me too. My coffee is also losing its skin. It's dying and I have to like uphold that. And then I also keep a, a thermos cup in my office so that I can put a water bottle in it and it'll stay oh, cool. Oh, it's like a until, water bottle cozy. Yeah, until I'm ready to drink it. Um, nice. I, it's hot in here. And I would only be in here in this kind of heat to do this kind of thing to be with you, Steph, for people that we love. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was contemplating doing the stream from my couch where I could have a fan blowing directly at my face instead of having to buffer my air conditioning sounds. But I decided it's the same to just here. go ahead and, yeah. Ugh, it's the worst, you guys. And Jill claims that we're going to be getting a, a reprieve, right? I'm not feeling Supposedly, it Supposedly, like after Wednesday or something, at least in math. I don't, I mean, I I don't know about you people further south. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like we were getting, maybe we got your your weather a day later. I don't know. I, I can't keep up anymore. <laughs> it's just like, I, I get up in the morning, I go get the, the, go to get the mail and I'm like, it's too hot to be alive. I just go back inside. <laughs> and then, you know, I think we both talked about our hair. I've got this like Justin Bieber swoop going on. <laughs> the fact that you can even have a swoop. I literally got out of the shower and was like, there's no, there's no blow drying anything. And I just let it air dry in the car. And then I, my hair was like this big. So um, just be thankful I, I took a well. shower. Yes, I know the feelings well. So I just realized I had jazz playing in the background. I don't know if anybody could hear that but me, but I did not hear that. <laughs> so happy Monday, you guys. Um, obviously Jill is here. We've got a fun thing to do. We're trying to do a co-stream today. Um, hopefully it's working. <laughs> nope, it looks um, it looks Drew. I've got Drew it in the YouTube. I see Marodim and Drew it on the on the Twitch. We I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. For some reason on my end, it's still, it's still not showing. So I, I don't know. 
Well, I mean, you know what? That's okay because you're the one that has to play the video. Or do you want me to play the video? Um, we'll we'll have to see if it doesn't play through through YouTube. You may have to play it, but all good. All good. Um, I guess let, let me do all of the the zillion announcements we have and also some cool stuff I happen to have on my desk right now. And then I am going to read um a little Sally Garut piece that um I ran out of time to read last week. And um, then we're going to get into this whole material culture thing. Um, let's see. Putting my phone on airplane mode. So don't text me anymore, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why, just to let everybody know, the reason why I have to go on airplane mode with my phone is I have an app on my computer that mimic like it mirrors my phone so every time i get a text message or, or a notification it like takes over my computer and like i can't hear anything and like it's it's wait it's if terrible. that's but like if that's true how on earth do you hide quilt purchases from your husband if your computer tattles on you <laughs> <laughs> it just goes ding ding and like cuts out the sound that's what it does but I mean, so like, this, is he trained every time it ding dings to go, what'd you buy now? No, no, he's, yeah, he's completely oblivious to everything. So <laughs> it's all good. Um, well, first of all, just a little tiny bit of fun. I just showed Jill this. Um, how many, and I know Druid, you probably did. How many people had play school, little people? I got the mama and a sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> and look at her comfy little chair, her little barrel back chair that she can sit at her sewing machine with. And then then here's the little blonde child who's going to feed the sewing machine with pins. <laughs> so does that sewing machine actually like have like a little quilt on it? Um, It's a little, uh, it looks like it's probably drapes or something. Mm -hmm. It's some sort of little thing. Hmm. Yeah, that's cute. I didn't have those, but play with them elsewhere. Yeah, I had um, I had a few little people, you know, I had, and these are the wooden ones. These are the the really old ones. Is um, the kid there to put pins in the sewing machine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it came with, you know, the mother and child. And I happen to have been a, a little blonde child like this. And then my mom actually has darker hair. So I might have to color. I might have to color her hair. But yes, me and my mom. <laughs> Um, I did not have, oh, you collect little people, Mario Dim. That's awesome. Um, I had a weird car park thing with my little people. You could put the car up and it would drive to, I don't know what the deal with that thing was, but I never had a house. So the sewing machine, this was something new to me. So. And where are they going to live? Right at your desk? Uh, they're going to have to live at my desk with, with my other things for now. I need. So I've been looking for some type of display for my, <clears throat> my children's stuff. So, you know, I have a bunch of play sewing machines and then I have like toy irons. Um, you know, I got that when I was with you, I got that little toy clothesline set with the little clothespins. Oh yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I have all of those little things and I don't really have a good place to display them. You know, they're, um, they're a little more durable than like the the fancy sewing tools and things that we both collect but you know still they're little things they're tiny things they're like needlework tools that you know like my little dollhouse one that mm -hmm. um this was also a recent acquisition and this is beautiful these little plastic things cost nowhere near as much <laughs> <laughs> as say an antique what? sewing tool uh-huh <laughs> This this one actually works. I don't know. I know I showed this um a while back, but I think I have one of those. It, yeah, it actually works. So, um, anyhow, hi Robin. Sewing sewing toys, sewing toys. Uh, so anyway, I'm I'm on the lookout for some kind of smart, interesting storage display solution. I and I just you know other than a cabinet or like shelving, I can't I can't figure out how to display this stuff. So. I was going to say, without just... one of those things, you're probably like SOL. <laughs> like... <laughs> I know. But I mean, it needs to be like, 
I don't know. It needs to be the kind of thing that's like not taking up floor space because I'm I, that's at a premium. I feel here. like you need to send me some pictures of your space so I can like like offer suggestions. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what them. any part of the inside of your house looks like. Like none. Other than your stairwell where you hang quilts. I have no idea what your house is like. You're well, a creature of it. mystery. <laughs> I hide it because there's piles of quilts and shit everywhere. I feel like of all um, the people that would judge you, it would not be me. Oh, well, I'm, you know, I judge myself. Um, but I go back all the time and, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys, you guys will get this. Um, if you are a quilter or a textile person or really any kind of, you know, handcrafts, whether you're a knitter or you end up with supplies and they can take over. And I mean, I am an artist, so, and my quilts are not necessarily just you know, fabric, they, many of my quilts have three-dimensional aspects to them. So I have other supplies and tools and, um, I just live in a small house, you know, and my husband's always like, ah, you filled this place up. And it's like, no, not really. Um, I think it's easy to say like, no matter how big of a space you get or how small your space is, we tend to fill them up. Um, but I, there is definitely rhyme or reason to, all of my stuff. It's just, I don't have storage. That's the real mm -hmm. problem. And I don't have any way to spread out. That is a downside to antique homes is they mm -hmm. lack a lot of storage that more modern yeah. homes have. To give you guys point in case, I don't have closets, no closets. There is one little cupboard type thing that's in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. my hus and my husband has like all of his jeans and t-shirts and things in there. And it's not deep enough to be a closet. It's only about like that deep so think about like a hanger mm -hmm. it lacks about four inches to be able to put a hanger in there so it doesn't have a, a hanging rod it's just got these shelves in there so anyway all of our clothes are hanging on a rack that sits in our bedroom outside of you know because I just don't have anywhere to put them and we've got you know furniture and stuff that Piles and piles of supplies, boxes and boxes. Yeah, like I have the clear tubs and all of the little wire things and stuff. And it just gets overwhelming at times. Yeah, I do. Well, and Marjim, you say that. I definitely, I do. A wardrobe would be great. Um, I think, I mean, I'd have to get rid of the rolling rack, <laughs> the clothing rack and put, you know, that piece of furniture there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's something that we've been talking about for a while, but. Well, and historically, whoever lived in your home originally would have used pieces of furniture as closets mm -hmm. than actual. Yeah, well, and they, they also had probably had, closets, but. yeah, they probably also had two changes of clothing <laughs> and like a couple of quilts. Well, <laughs> I, I have, know, like... if we're talking about the Victorian period where they packed their houses full of stuff. But um yeah, you know, and I don't know whole I well, I have a little teeny bit of information about the owner of the house during the late Victorian period, like up to night. I think she sold the house in 1920 something. Mm -hmm. Um, so like the the teens and maybe like she may have moved in here around 1890 ish. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of got that end period. Um and she actually was the wife of a general store owner. I think you I think you might have said this before yeah he yeah. was it was a it was a oh it was this wild story about they actually owned a general store kind of catty cornered to my street so it's like within walking distance and there were intruders one night they lived above the store it was her her husband I don't can't remember how many kids they had some of them lived at home some of them were still you know small children some were old enough to be out on their own and then they I think they had two employees that were like shop helpers or whatever and they they stayed there too and the house was or the shop was broken into and the the man you know the, the owner he went out chasing after these people that had broken in and they shot and killed him oh, and wow. to this day it was never solved um but it was the largest funeral to that point that had been held in baltimore county which is you know outside the city we're, we're 14 miles outside the city which late 1800s wasn't just next door you know it was a, a little bit of a of a ride or a drive so anyway there there's this pretty well-known story it was in the baltimore sun you know about this man's murder and um 
she was pregnant when it happened. And so her one child was born after her father's death. So, you know, there's this whole story there about them. And so she, at some point had, you know, owned this house and, um, he Jan and then, um, sold it to her daughter briefly. <clears throat> and then there were two more owners after that. So, yeah. And I don't know, in terms of this Victorian era, I don't know that, I, I, I have no proof whatsoever that she was in here with, you know, elephant foot, <laughs> <laughs> umbrella stands and all that stuff. <laughs> um, it's entirely possible, but something tells me that, you know, not the likely. furniture was, yeah, like they definitely did not have the big overstuffed couch with the denim slip covers like I have, which take up a lot of room, so yeah, it probably wasn't as difficult for them, but nonetheless, um, definitely she was not filling her house with tiny play school sewing <laughs> <laughs> So, anywho, well, so announcement. We've, we've chatted and chatted. Um, <laughs> I told you we would. <laughs> I know. So announcements. Um, tomorrow, of course, we have, uh, we're, we're, closing in on the last chapters of crazy quilts by uh petting mcmorris and that's on youtube um jill and i do that book club on tuesday nights 8 p.m eastern time then we're going to be switching to a patchwork pillowcases uh, and this is actually written by our friend Anne hermes and so that is very exciting in between those two books jill has gotten some footage from the new england quilt museum and a very cool show, um, Stitch Punk, which mm -hmm. also included some crazy quilts from um, the New England Quilt Museum. So we'll be looking at those as, um, so it'll it's not tomorrow, but tomorrow week, right? Next week. The 23rd. Yeah. Um, also this week on Wednesday is a, a double doozy <laughs> because <laughs> at 2 p.m. Eastern is my textile talk um, about the 2024 Artist James Scholars. So I will be doing that at 2 p.m. Eastern. And then Wednesday night, Jill and I will be doing needlework nights, which we do every other week. And this week is um, the paper souvenir needle books. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, oh, very important that I, I meant to say. Um, and I I posted a little calendar um, of some important dates the other day on the um, Cake TV Facebook page. But just to let you know, I'm going to skip this Thursday stream so that we have the pop-up on Saturday. I was, Jill and I were talking earlier. I'm like, I cannot add another stream. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm exhausted this week already and it's only Monday. So um, just because I have so much going on and we've just got a lot in general. We have a lot going on week. behind the scenes too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So Thursday will be canceled. I'm going to call that my vacation day and we're going to pick up the stream on Saturday. Now, Saturday is going to start at 11 a.m. and we are going to be looking at Dana Balsamo's auction. So it'd be very exciting. I've already, we've scoped it out. Some of you guys might have as well. And there's just such cool quilts in there. Um, I believe there some are from the collection of Bobby Ogg, who I'm not familiar with, but um, you know, we'll look into that before the stream um, on Saturday. So I think that's everything. <laughs> There's so, so much. And if, if anyone wonders what I keep looking at, I am working on the cotton project while we're, while we're, oh, yeah, that was here. the other thing. I have mine ready to go. I have traced out. <gasps> design on my fabric yeah Dude, I did that such an night. underachiever um <laughs> actually let's see what did I do with it, it where's your little it must, box my little box must be sitting back there on my table I, while I was talking to you earlier I moved it around and I must have moved it off the desk yeah. so hey mod art um so yeah I'll I'll show that we'll look at that next time <laughs> um maybe I could get some stitching done on it um so yeah, that's exciting. I'm glad you're working well, on yours too. That in um the reason I was reminded to kind of work on this, especially while you're gonna just like take a quick a quick a quick peek at that Sally Garut thing was um we're halfway through the Mary Witherwax so along that you just posted the other day. I 
am, am, am I am not halfway through. I am super behind. I did take some stitches into it though yesterday. Um, while I was watching a documentary that I went like down this rabbit hole. Um, but it just reminded me today if I am potentially going to use some of those blocks to use this cotton on to, to do a little, which to be honest with you, this is my picked cotton. I probably have enough, but I'm like, I need something to do with my hands. So I'm not just like looking into nothing. So I'll just keep picking away. But um, that reminded me about that project so many projects <laughs> I know right yeah we keep picking up projects and and finishing some of them <laughs> well we're gonna get there you guys we promise it's just gonna take us a while <laughs> um oh one thing I wanted to show before so I'm gonna read a little piece by Sally Garut that I mentioned the other day but before we get to that the new issue of Piecework magazine is out um oh Mara Dim, that's awesome you introduced your daughter to Mary Witherwax that is so cool I cannot wait to see what you guys do. Yeah. So speaking of Mary Witherwax, our friend Dawn, who is the the mother of the Mary Witherwax pattern book, <laughs> um, she is in Piecework Magazine again. Um, so anytime you ever see a, a needle roll or something, your first question should be, is that Dawn Ronigan? Because it is. <laughs> um, I knew she said she had something coming up. And I think Jill and I had kind of put it together that she might be doing another piecework project. Um, I know she's had like two or three over the past couple of years. And mm -hmm. um, I'm a longtime subscriber to piecework. So this one is this very cool um, sewing roll. It's a it's a mending kit, basically. Um, so you can see it's got, you know, the place to put threads and scissors and all that stuff so it's I have not had a chance it literally just came in the mail this morning so I have not had a chance to look through it yet um but I'm excited about this and of course we always love to see um yeah so it's got instructions and everything so it's a really good to magazine that. too that, that has a whole variety really of needlework type related things mm -hmm. in it yeah, I, you know, I sometimes I get irritated because it does have a lot of knitting and crochet and tatting and things in it. Um, but they really do this incredible job of, of you know, re recruiting and accepting written articles about like history and all kinds of cool stuff. So, um, yeah, this is a this is one of only a handful of magazines that I actually subscribe to and read. So mm -hmm. and anyway, I, I just like wanted to under the radar. I feel it like does it needs, a little it, bit. Yeah, yeah, I think it needs a little more uh promotion yeah well it's got an interesting history because piecework was one of those ones that was part of the interweave family for a while mm -hmm. um and it's a magazine that's been around for a very long time and uh, my mom used to subscribe to and that's like how I got to know it um but they were part of one of those like the investors come <laughs> and wreak havoc and uh you know Fonz and Porter they were part of one of those Wall Street mm -hmm investors you know they come in and say they're gonna infuse cash and they basically shut stuff down well that almost happened to piecework um but the original editor of piecework um like i guess she was the founder she came in opened a new business in order to take piecework back oh. so um that's she and it's published by long tail media now so um yeah, Long Tail Media. I think it's the they have. Oh, a, you just know, you just know, and... like all the hot goss, huh? Yeah, I do. <laughs> not all, not all the hot goss, um, but anyway, they have a they have a podcast, a bunch of different stuff, and they actually have a cool thing if you subscribe that you can. Um, they have different levels of subscription where you can access like all of their past publications and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's it's a pretty good deal if you're into this. So hmm. anyway, they're not paying me. But you know what, Longtail Media, if you wanted to pay us, we would shill your magazine because <laughs> it's a good magazine. So anyway, just wanted to plug our friend on. Um, and uh, yeah, you can buy this online, I think, as a PDF if you don't have it in your bo local bookstore. Mm -hmm. So I think that is everything I wanted to mention. Um, so let's read this from Sally Guru. And... Did I print where it was from? I did not, but hold on a minute and I can tell you because the reason why I knew about this, this article, um, and it is from Joyce Gross's, um, 
publication. Um, so it's from Quilter's Journal in 1978. So it's summer 1978. Um, and she wrote a couple of articles, but this one was interesting to me because this is about scrap quilts, not crazy quilts. Um, although Penny McMorris referenced this article and another one in um, her Crazy Quilts book. But I just thought this one was kind of sweet and charming. And I read the first page and I thought, we'll read both pages here online. So okay. again, Quilter's Journal, which was Joyce Gross's publication. And Sally Garut wrote this in 1978. And it's called The Scrappy Mother. Although many writers, beginning in 1929 with Ruth E. Finley, have said that the earliest and original patchwork quilts must have been crazy quilts, I believe this to be unlikely. And we know. <laughs> Today we know it is. <laughs> um, the theory has been that patchwork was born in the need for patching blankets in the early colonial era when every scrap of cloth had to be put to use, and that this led in inevitably to crazy quilts. The Orlovskis, while agreeing with the persuasiveness of this idea, affirm the following. Hey, Kenny. This is conjecture. There are no existing examples of this type of quilt known to the authors dating before the 19th century. Nor are there written descriptions or illustrations which would confirm the existence of the crazy quilt at an earlier date. And... You know, like at this point with all of that history to look back at, we're like, yeah, the Arlovskis and Sally Garut, you guys are correct. Ruth Finley was the one who was wrong. And, you know, I mean, we we read Ruth Finley here and that was the first book that we read. And I think I was frequently as I'm going through it going, I don't think that's right. I think she's wrong about that. There's a lot of stuff <laughs> Ruth Finley was wrong. And the other thing is it, it, it kind of to come full circle, like Ruth Finley was not a quilter. She was a journalist. So you get a lot of people writing things that, you know, are, are making claims that really have no experience in this world. And, um, you know, they perpetuate ideas that are not that are not accurate. And I, I will not digress into the other areas because we have done that here, too. <laughs> Hidden in plain sight, anyone? Mm -hmm. um, so. The Forefather Song, composed in Massachusetts in 1630, <laughs> is often referred to in support of the theory of crazy original quilts. And it goes as follows. And now our garments begin to grow thin, and wool is much wanted to card and to spin. If we can get a garment to cover without, our other in garments are clout upon clout. Our clothes we brought with us are apt to be torn. They need to be clouded soon after they're warm worn um i don't know what clout means <laughs> um but i think it means it must mean like mending i don't know patching patching i guess however getting from the patched clothing in this verse to the phenomenon of pieced quilts is a very long jump which skips over two practical questions first considering the art of mending the wear patterns are different in bed clothing and garments. In clothing, the abrasions come at particular places, the seat, the knees, and elbows. After patching, those areas continue to be abraded and may indeed be patched more than once, clout upon clout. So yeah, that, that must be yeah, what Yeah, I just looked it up. The, the archaic meaning is to mend with a patch. A patch, okay. Yeah. A blanket, however, wears out very gradually in the entire wears that very gradually in the entire center, which becomes weakened overall so that a patch will not hold. It is usually reconstructed for, con for continued use by cutting it down the center and sewing the two sound sides together to form a new, stronger center. I thought this was very interesting. Um, you know, I've definitely seen quilts that have been cut down. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you and I have, have been in places where they talk about quilts cut down. But what she's talking about is... You've got a quilt. You're going to cut it down the center because it's worn here, right? Cut it down the center and then put it together like this. Put it back together like this. Interesting. That's what she's talking about. And I'm like, have we seen evidence of that? I don't know. Would that also mean you have to cut off the binding as well? I would think so. Unless so you're going to make it look semi potholdery in a way, I guess. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's just people that did this were so good at it. We don't know. It just looks like 
I don't know. It's just, it's interesting to me. And I'm, I was like, well, that's an interesting theory. I don't know that I've seen anything that like that, that I know of. Yeah. And this is a question to ask our, the people who stand, whose shoulders we stand upon mm-hmm. <laughs> because uh, some of our, our, uh, our friends who have much more experience in this than we do, if, if these things exist, they've seen it. So mm-hmm. I, I throw that question out, you know, and I'll, um, I'll have to ask some some particulars. So if there are moth holes to repair, darning rather than patching is preferable. Darning is a form of reweaving, which restores the woven web and is not lumpy as a patch would be. It is doubtful that patching was ever much used to restore blankets. And, you know, I think about, you know, like woven coverlets. I don't, that's probably the wrong example to use. But if you've seen those really beautiful woven coverlets that have the beautiful patterns, I mean, those, it makes sense. Those are woven. It makes sense Mm -hmm. to reweave those versus Mm -hmm. putting a patch on them. Second, the idea that colonial women made bed covers by sewing scraps together in random fashion does not seem reasonable. No random groups of scraps will fit together neatly like a jigsaw puzzle and turn out to be a large, flat, smooth bed cover. In making a quilt from scraps, the alternatives are that the pieces are A, overlapped, and B, cut to, or B, cut to fit. Overlapping is not as easy as it seems to be. There is the problem of the edges of the pieces. They must either be embroidered heavily or turned under in order to keep them from fraying. In the colonial era, embroidery was limited to was limited to very few very ugh, to a very few stitches, blanket, chain, and stem mostly. And embroidery floss was extremely hard to come by. In a time of scarcity, embroidery would not have been used for mending. On the other hand, turning under the edges of heavy woolen fabric gives a lumpy result, particularly when several patches overlap. And such treatment of the many edges of irregular scraps is difficult and time-consuming. The other choice, cutting to fit, more nearly resembles familiar piece work. The simplest and most economical method of cutting is to use a rectangular module as a basic pattern. Scraps which are too small to make a complete module can be pieced out to size with others. This we have seen. (laughs) Just such a scrap quilt is the one pictured on the previous page and... I printed this in black and white, but you can see, I mean, it's just a scrappy, they're not Mm -hmm. squares exactly. You've got a lot more going on over on this side than you do on this side. Mm -hmm. Um, Just such a scrap quilt is the one picture on the previous page made about 1910. In this, no particular pattern has been attempted. Although the sizes of the pieces vary, they all have square corners and add up to equal widths so that they fit easily together. Furthermore, this type of quilt is very easy to make, being seamed, not overlapped. It requires no edge finishing. These characteristics are common to a number of early pieced quilts from England, Canada, and the United States. And then she gives a few um, a few uh, books that that reference this stuff like um, Avril Colby's Patchwork, um, Peace Quilts of Ontario, uh, one of the Holstein books, etc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These quilts fit the requirements of quilts made for warmth under conditions of scarcity and hardship. They do not in any way resemble crazy quilts. Further, we should not be led astray by our present understanding of the word patch. The original meaning was of a piece of cloth appliqued onto another fabric for decoration. Clout or clute. You know, I'm wondering if it's clute. It's C- it's C L O U T. Yeah. I so. mean, I would look at that and think it's clout. <laughs> well, yeah, because that's how that's how we pronounce it today, but it might be clute. Anyway, this was the word for piece of cloth to cover a hole. As our needlework vocabulary has never included clout work or clute work as a technique, I do not think that patchwork is derived from a need to mend blankets or clothing. I believe that patchwork came from our need to make something pretty. Nor do I think that pieced quilts came only from the practical desire to use up every last bit of fabric. In colonial times, mattresses, or beds as they were called, were only large sacks filled with anything handy. Feather beds were preferred, but a bed might be filled with ends of yarn or snippets of cloth. These are called flocked beds. Or leaves, corn husks, or cattail down. There were other uses for the last tiny bit of cloth. 
It appears to me that the homely scrap quilt made of rectangular pieces was the real mother of pieced quilts and that the women who made the first ones were aiming to use their extra fabric in a practical and visually pleasing way. Hmm. So, I mean, this just goes back like this. To me, this is kind of um, tish. To me, this is like a little bit of a 101 because I do think, you know, there was this point in time where people really had not, and, and not that long ago, really. I mean, this is written in 79 or 78. Um, <clears throat> but I think even like quilting things that I would go to, and obviously not AQSG stuff where, you know, <laughs> the the people who have done the hardcore research are but you know just general quilting events and so much of this kind of stuff was still you know like the that colonial women made quilts because they had to be economical they had to mm -hmm. use up all these little scraps of fabric and that is absolutely not true mm -hmm. uh, we know now there are these beautiful colonial era quilts and they were using fabric that was purchased specifically for the quilt their whole cloth quilts or their um you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the colonial era that's white work, chintz, like all that kind of stuff. We're not, you know, we're not quite at patchwork yet. Um, and then crazy quilts are really absolutely defined by that that time period in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. um, as we've read the crazy quilts book and just learned about crazy quilts, I almost feel like any of us could win Jeopardy about crazy quilts because like <laughs> the dates 1883 and 1884 <laughs> are like the pinnacle. Um, not to say that there weren't crazy quilts made, you know, in the 1870s, late 1870s or 1890s, 1900, but it's like 1884, 1883 were the years that like, it just went wild and everybody made a crazy quilt. So, um, and the, I think the reason why I wanted to kind of connect this, I mean, I, I was going to read it last week, but I wanted to connect this is because the idea of material culture is about the objects in our world, right? And I, for a long time, I was like, I don't know what material culture is. And it's really such a simple concept that it's almost like mind blowing that it's material culture, essentially, you guys, is everything. Everything that we use, tools, decoration, monuments, buildings, ephemera, like anything that we create and use for a purpose. And, and it has, you know, we can describe its purpose. So quilt obviously fit right in there. Um, and you know, I, I think it's through material culture studies is where we tease apart the history of these these objects that often people have taken for granted because it's, again, it's this thing that's, you know, in your surroundings and, and you don't necessarily think about where did it come from? Why mm -hmm. do people, why did people do this? Why did, why did it turn out looking this way and not some other way? Mm -hmm. So I thought that would be um, a good segue. Yeah. So. What we are going to watch is um, a wonderful new program that is being put out by the American Quilt Study Group, um, and it is about material culture, and I think I talked about it a little bit last week. Um, Jill and I will eventually be part of it, <laughs> um, but in the meantime, it's, you know, it's starting off as explaining what material culture is, how it shows up. Um, Etc. I was, I was just going to say, do you want me to share? Because I've got YouTube premium, so I won't have any um, ads. You know, that would actually be really great because I'm worried because I've got the YouTube. You've got YouTube. too much stuff going on over there. I, yeah, I'm just worried like YouTube streaming is not going to like this. Yeah. So yeah. that might be good. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, yeah, then you can just, you can pause as needed. Yes. Um, and make sure when you share, make sure that you choose to share your desktop audio. Oh, thank so you for that. <laughs> our peoples, our peoples will be able to hear. Okay. Is that coming through good? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And let me just, my audio is currently very high. <laughs> Tell me how, how sounds coming through. The American Quilt Study Group presents Quilts in a Material World. It's good. It's a little low, but I think Tara was what is a little bit lower than Susie. Culture? Presented by Susan J. Jerome. Susan J. Jerome is a collections manager at the University of Rhode Island Historic Textile and Costume Collection and the curator registrar for the University of Connecticut M. Estelle Sprague Costume Collection. 
She earned her MS degree from the University of Rhode Island, focusing on textile and clothing history. Ms. Jerome sits on the National Board of the American Quilt Study Group and the Costume Society of America Northeastern Region Advisory Committee. She writes and lectures on topics of clothing and needlework history. Hi everyone, my name is Susan Jerome and I am delighted to be the first presenter in a series put on by the American Quilt Study Group titled Quilts in a Material World. Um, I think for me, this quote says quite a bit about what quilts mean to women's history and to the history of people in general, particularly in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And this is one of the reasons why I am very passionate about quilts and quilts history, is that a quilt can tell you so much about a person, a person's life, where they lived, their economic status, um, perhaps some of the things they enjoyed in life and such, all in the little pieces of fabric that they might have stitched together at those odd moments that they could find in their lives. So I'm going to begin with a little discussion of what a material culture is. Material culture really looks at everyday items. It goes beyond looking at history from the perspective of the famous or political boundaries or battles that were fought. Material culture looks at a group of people by looking at their ordinary things, the things that they made, the things that they used in their lives that could be dug up from the ground or found in an inventory list. The ordinary is um, something that James Deeds talks about in his book, in Small Things Forgotten, which is one of the first books published on material culture studies in the 1970s. What is a material culture study? It's a I wanted I wanted to make the point here that <clears throat> what Susan is talking about in terms of um, feminism and material culture is important to think about because instead of studying history through the lens of famous people, we think about history, especially this history, um, pre 20th century history, the the women <laughs> are very few and far between in terms of famous people. Um, and when you try to, to research women, a particular woman, you're often running into a woman with no first name, or a woman who is known as Mrs. You know, James Jones, like you, you don't know her name, you don't know where she came from. So in studying the you know material culture of something like a quilt um you may still not unveil the actual names of people but you learn more about these these anonymous women in that you know this this what we're looking at here what she's showing is a very scrappy quilt that very likely had you know um garment fabric in it and so that tells us something about you know what the consumption of the household and you know, and sometimes we're lucky enough to have a name or some initials or some dates. And that is the hand of the woman who made or the women who made the quilt. So feminism, I feel like, especially in this context, we've got a very nice dovetailing of feminism and material culture. I mean, would you agree with that? Did Absolutely. I have been like that she's talking about, you know, how it's tools. And I had heard because for anyone that doesn't know, my academic training is in religious material culture. And um, when people would be like, what's that? I'd be like, religious stuff. The people that, like the things that people made in the name of religion is religious material culture. Mm -hmm. um, but when she talked about like the tools of, I had heard someone describe material culture as like the the tools of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the things, the things you use to live, like a quilt is for warmth or for display or, you know, just for pretty. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know where I was going with that thought. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at this quilt going, wow, it's really pretty. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the history of anything can be like, you can use the material culture route. I mean, if you want to do the history of your town, then you've got all the buildings in your town and the historical yep. stuff that was created. Yep. But when we drill down into quilts, 
then, you know, we have this very specific set of things. And like, there's the needlework tools, there's the quilts themselves, there's the fabric there. So all of these things, she's asking questions. Mm -hmm. So let's hear more from Susie. <laughs> I just also wanted to point out that because of the way Stephanie and I are streaming, our Zoom stream is covering Susie's up in the corner. So you are hearing her voice. And if you go and you look at the actual YouTube, which of course will be linked down, we're, wow. we're technically over her. You'd see her speaking. And her and I are actually wearing the same shirt. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you are. Everything. Yeah, same oh color gosh, and everything. Are. Um, yeah, but yeah, I just funny. want people to know that like, if you wonder where this voice is coming from, Susie is on the screen. It's just, we're currently over her. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I, that's the one thing I dislike about how Zoom does it asks this. the questions oh. of who, what, when, where, why, and how. And it explores the ways in which if you're looking at a quilt. The quilt was made, from what it was made, who may have made it, who may have used it, how was it used? And then finally asks the question, what does it mean to us today? It's a way of exploring the stories that are behind an object. And for us who are quilt historians, quilt fanatics, it's a way to look at the stories behind the material of the quilt. Questions to ask, and you can see them listed here. Who made the quilt? Do you know when it was made? Who used it? All the way down to, can you find other contemporary examples of the quilt? that may help to look at it as a comparison. Is it very unique or is it a log cabin based on a, dare I say, typical log cabin quilt? Finally, a material culture study looks at what does the quilt mean to us today? Is it in a collection? Is it considered monetarily valuable? The reasons for a quilt's existence today is really part of the history of the piece. Provenance is I a way to start. If, can we pause again? A little bit. <laughs> we, ha you know, you know, always have a hot take on everything. Um, <laughs> but we have to, we have to pause a little bit just for copyright reasons, to like, um, overlay ourselves. But I love those those questions she gives because mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. You could literally do this kind of study on a quilt. If you already know some of those things, like it's your family quilt or something, and all of those questions are the questions that we often like commiserate and are disappointed when we don't know about a quilt, right? So <laughs> full circle it, label your quilts. <laughs> so then people in the future don't have to go who, what, where, when, why. It's all right there, you know, with some exceptions, unless you want to write a whole whole story but just the basics of who made it where they were when they were if it was made for somebody as a gift you know it, it answers so many of those questions mary had made a point to on one of her streams once that she loves when someone puts how old they were when they made it as well you know yeah, because I always, there's yeah. so much to say about what time of your life that you're in what season mm -hmm. you know are you eight and and just like a super overachiever where you and I couldn't tie our shoes at eight or you know are you just getting married or are you in your twilight years you know like there's a lot to say for everything that informs your mm -hmm. quilt making at different times in your life yeah absolutely you ready yeah okay it at this particular square that you see on the right. You see it has a name on it, Mary Eleanor Bristow. And you can see that it is unfinished. This quilt came to the University of Rhode Island unfinished. Uh, it was given by what we think is the maker's granddaughter. It's supposed to be a baby quilt. And a series of blocks that have names that have been embroidered on them. When you look at Mary Eleanor Bristow's name, you can see that it has been written onto a piece of paper with her birth date to be used as a pattern for embroidering her name and the date onto a piece of fabric. It's very nice to have a quilt that has names and dates on it. All of the names and dates are of uh, boys and girls living in the Southern Rhode Island area 
and their birth dates fall between 1912 and 1916. So this gives us a pretty good idea as to where the quilt was made and when it was made. Now, I could look into Google, look in the internet, and find many of the men still existing, doing things throughout the early 20th century, find their grave sites and some of the graveyards in southern Rhode Island. It's much more difficult to find the women. Why? Because they change their names when they get married, and they're more likely to move away from Rhode Island. However, Mary's somebody whom I could find. One of the nice things about a material culture study is it can take you down a path and lead you to actually being able to see a person. The unfinished baby quilt, dated around 1915, made with red and white cotton fabrics, bordered with the names of children between 1912 and 1916. Mary was easy to find because she never married and she never moved away from southern Rhode Island. So we have on the right her graduation picture and then on the left the picture that I could capture from her, her obituary. Curatorial information can help in a material culture study. This is a quilt that came into URI, um, having passed through five different people before it actually was donated to the university. It's a spider web or cobweb quilt that you can see. And I suspect one of the reasons why it was kept is because it was made by William Strange. There was a newspaper article that you can see on the right, dated September 1929. Mr. Strange hand sewed the quilt, has several thousand pieces in it, and he entered it into a local fair in Connecticut and apparently won a prize. These kinds of stories are part of looking at a material culture, studying a piece, gathering up information about the quilt, which leads us to the people behind them. And I sort of feel like material this might be an area, oops, Go ahead. So that those stories behind the quilt, I think are some is, is kind of where we sometimes get into trouble. Um, and I see we collectively, not you and I specifically, although you and I are always in trouble. But <laughs> um, what I was going to say, though, is like a quilt that has passed through five different hands. In a perfect world, and this this is possibly the case with this quilt, you know, when you see things in museums, they typically have maybe not a rock solid provenance, but they have a good provenance because, you know, museums don't want something that's spotty. Like they want to know what they're getting and where it came from. Um, but think about all the quilts out there and the stories you've heard about them. If you've, you know, you go to a quilt dealer, oh, they have stories to tell. <laughs> and we've we've kind of, you know, I mean, there are our friends you know, in, in EQSG and, and folks that study quilts extensively are like, don't listen to the hype. You have to be able to prove it. Um, and so that's, you know, documenting again, who made the quilt, who got it next and so on down the line. I mean, I specifically, I have a quilt that my great grandmother made the blocks and then it ties in with my uncle and then my grandmother finished it into a quilt. And it, this is over like a 50 year time period, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and now I it, it belongs to me. So that's something like I would need to, I really need to document that. And now this is not a quilt that's going to end up in a museum, <laughs> but just for the purpose of, of making this a regular practice, um, you know, it, it, when it passes through so many hands, you I think that bits and pieces get added on to the story and then other important details might get lost, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's like playing a game of telephone mm -hmm. and we all exactly. know what happens when we play a game of telephone. Exactly. <laughs> but who knows? Your, your family quote could end up in a museum someday. Maybe. Just, you never know. Probably not. <laughs> but if nothing, like you should definitely like write all that down because yeah. you have a child well, and, and, the best part is some of the information is written down and I, I've showed the quilt here before, but um, my grandmother, she embroidered a little story on the corner of it to say, you know, when the quilt was started, who started it and who she is and how it was finished and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Study involves 
the physical characteristics. And you can look at those first when you're doing a material culture study. So if you're looking at a quilt, you're going to look at the dimensions. Is it pieced? Is it appliqued? You can see the quilt on the right here is um, our blocks that are set on point, which is something very typical for a Rhode Island quilt. There's no border around it. There's no sashing. Again, these are characteristics of Rhode Island quilts. Once you gather all the information together, the physical information together, that's the beginning of a material culture study. Then you can perhaps look at some of the physical characteristics. One of the things that is fun to do is to try to identify the fibers from which a quilt can be made. Often in the 19th century, you have your choice of four different kinds of fibers. The upper left with the um, sort of knobs and the striations that you see on those fibers, that's a flax fiber from which linen is made. On the right, the upper right is a wool fiber with its very recognizable scales. That wool fiber has been chewed by insects, so you can see the little bites taken out of the end. Below it, the spiral fiber is cotton perfect cotton spiral that you can look for when you look under a microscope. Next to it on the left is silk. Silk is probably the one fiber that we see that has very little Pause for a sec. Mama is a fan is reading us. <laughs> what, 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 what? Hi. Hi, Mama is a fan. Hi. <laughs> and your, your, your audience. Thank you so much for rating us. We are in the middle of looking at, um, a, it's it's called uh, Quilts in a Material World. It is a, a program that's being rolled out um, through AQSG. It's on um, it's on YouTube. It's it's free to watch. But we thought we would do a watch party today. So you guys came in at a perfect time looking at the physical characteristics of uh, fibers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've I actually in here and it's like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, um, I I half of me is sitting here going, oh my god, do I need a microscope now? I will also point out. Steph and I have not watched this yet. So you're seeing our our raw reaction to what's in here, which was part of part of the idea. Um and I I'm really like sad to admit that I had not I have yet to investigate any of these different kinds of fibers via microscope. So yeah, and that's you know, and that is an interesting thing to do. Um, I only very, very briefly got to look at this kind of stuff when I was in school. Um, our textile department did have, you know, some ability to look at things with microscopes and all that jazz. But, you know, I was always like, eh, who cares? Um, <laughs> honestly, it is my interest. This is crazy. It's my interest in true crime that actually gives me some interest in this because, you know, they look at like, well, it's a trilobe polyester possibly from, you know, a, a carpet or carpet fiber from a, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, this is so interesting. And I love that the wool has the little tiny insect bites in it. <laughs> like, Ew, yeah, was, but also I cool. was wondering, I was wondering what, what that was. Uh-huh. Yeah. And one thing that I wanted to talk about in the, in the previous, um, her previous slide was about, um, you know, collecting the physical characteristics of, of, a, of an object, you know, a quilt is easy. You can measure it. You can look and say, you know, it's, it's got X number of patches or pieces in it. It's got, you know, this and that, um, and she mentioned this is a Rhode Island quilt because blah, blah, blah. It doesn't have a border, et cetera. That is such a huge piece of this for people who study quilts is trying to put it in a place and time if they don't have that information, which, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I'm saying label your quilts, <laughs> you know, because without that information, they have to then become a detective and it's, and it, these are the interesting things that we've been learning is like when you look at a quilt and it's got these types of motifs or this type of sashing or this type of border or this type of backing, it is a good chance or it, it points to the fact that it comes from this this area, this geographic area or or this community or this time period. Obviously, the fabrics themselves inform that, too. So, mm -hmm. all right. Ready? <laughs> yeah. They look just like glass rods. 
But you want to identify, if you can, the fibers of the top, the batting, the backing, even the sewing thread and the quilting threads to see um, what they're made out of. It's part of a material culture study. The fabrics, are they printed cottons, silks, ribbons and such? The ribbon that you see in the lower left-hand corner is dated 1885. And there were several ribbons in this particular quilt that was donated to the university that have um, Freemason ribbons from Norwich, Connecticut, 1884, 1885, which is, gives us a good idea, not only of the dating of the quilt, and of course it's a crazy quilt, so that is another clue, but also gives us an idea as to where the quilt would have been made originally around the Norwich area. Unfortunately, this quilt was donated in 1956 by a Mrs. Mervyn Miller, and the person accepting the quilt into the university's collection didn't think to ask her what her name was. And I cannot yet find a Mrs. Mervyn Middler, either in Rhode Island or in Connecticut. So I'm still looking for her name and her information because apparently this quilt came through her family to the university. On the right hand side, you see this bright chrome yellow, which is very indicative of textiles from the printed cottons from the early part of the 19th century, 1830s, 1840s. And below it, you can see the blue that progresses downward to the brown fabric right below it. Again, this ombre print, which is very typical of printed cotton fabrics from the 1830s and 1840s. So these are clues as to when this particular quilt would have been made. This and is that's the information quilt. we chase. The university. <laughs> well, and it's funny because, you know, if we're showing a crazy quilt that could have endless fabrics in it, mm -hmm. when you think about how long you could spend looking at one quilt to try to date it because obviously it's only as old as the newest fabric in the quilt mm -hmm. um i mean days you could be looking at it you know with you know i looked at it on on monday and then i looked at it on saturday and all of a sudden noticed seven new things that i didn't mm -hmm. notice during my last deep dive um I yeah, like that's why I... scrappy quilts and crazy quilts, they're so fun, right? Because they've got so much cool stuff to look at. But then trying to put dates. Well, luckily, we've as we've seen, the crazy quilts, for whatever reason, they dated those all the time. Yeah. But and then they included things like those silk ribbons and stuff that are that help with dates. But um yeah, these these kind of scrappy things can become like really frustrating if you don't have any information on them because you do, you have to look at every piece in there and sort of be the detective you know and that's where i get frustrated just because i'm still still get my feet wet with dating fabrics reliably and so you know of course the crazy quilts for me are easier because i know those are those are dated but often but um like what she's showing here or some of these older quilts you know it's 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 a struggle oh yeah no the the i i don't really know what it takes to feel comfortable with mm -hmm. you know with like your your fabric knowledge if there's like a a pinnacle you can reach where you just feel I'm comfy um <laughs> I have not reached that pinnacle <laughs> I'm I'm yeah. often like I think I mean I feel like generally speaking my gut is correct more often than not but that doesn't mean that I feel confident in my mm -hmm. gut sometimes it just wants a sandwich you know like I you know <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> All right, here we go. As you can see, it's on point, just blocks, no sashing, no edging. Very typical of quilts in Rhode Island at the time. The red fabric is quite fascinating because it looks like, as you can see, a toile. These fabrics with the large, um, often printed scenes of famous people and places or a pastoral scene, something like that. Very popular for bed hangings and curtains, other household textiles in the latter part of the 18th and early 19th centuries. 
So one of the graduate students at the university decided she was going to try to figure out what the 12 pattern was. So she took a picture of all of the pieces of red and then like a jigsaw puzzle, put them together and found out that the original toile was this pattern here, which was produced in Nantes in France between 1788 and 1793. So this tells us that the quilt was made after that time, but the fact that somebody would have taken what would be an expensive fabric used for bed hangings, used to demonstrate your wealth in your house. Somebody took that fabric and cut it up into little pieces. It certainly suggests that the quilt was made years after that when the bed hangings were no longer being used within the home for household furnishings. This quilt has other things to tell us as well. If you look closely at it, it is in fact a quilt inside a quilt. Around the edges, you can see that there are bits and pieces of a different printed fabric inside. And when you look through a light with a light in the back, you can see sort of a bit of the pattern. So this quilt, by looking at it closely, shows us that people were putting quilts, old quilts, inside a quilt, using that as a batting, using old textiles in order to you know, recycle, reuse, repurpose, very modern ideas today. Speaking of that sandwiches. Is interesting is the front. <laughs> you know, I have to say, I have, I have a, uh, I don't know, at least a couple of quilts, whether it's in my personal collection or my inventory that have, I have something else inside and man the the drive to want to know what's inside it um yeah that you know that is something fierce i have not taken anything apart um but i have i have definitely thought on more than one occasion like oh i really I really want to and I mean it's probably not anything actually I think one of them might be a wool crazy if I'm remembering correctly which it's like god if you why were you trying to make that thing any heavier than it already was <laughs> being a wool crazy um right <laughs> so half of me is like am I helping am I helping someone by making this lighter because someone did want me to ship it once um the the, the fact that like norm I feel like on normally i i don't ever hear about much that's inside that's really exciting mm -hmm. usually it's it's something far more utilitarian that's inside than not but um yeah and usually it's because it's not in great shape anyway mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. but i understand the call of the like what does it look like yeah. you know and and you know you don't want to like destroy an okay quilt to find out you know what a not very good condition quilt inside of it is but then again it could be very old and more interesting than you know it's a I don't have any like that I have one quilt that is absolutely heinous and it does have it's a blanket on the inside though and I have started oh. I op I've opened up one edge just to see because it's tied mm -hmm. so it's not like literally cutting through quilting it's just tied and I've started to peel it back and I'm like huh neither of these are very <laughs> <laughs> very interesting or exciting but you know it's interesting to study it again it's some interesting fabric it's an it's a blanket where I'm like I think I could probably pinpoint the date of the blanket so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the front of this quilt again it's on point no sashing no edging this variable stars from the 1830s has a much older fabric on the back you can see across the top the faded section suggests that the original pillar print might have been used mm, as curtains or certainly near a window where the sun faded the fabric. So rather than just dispose of it, because of course fabric would have been expensive at the time, the quilt maker decided to use it for the backing of this quilt. Look closely at your pieces. This particular quilt we know was made in Rhode Island and it shows some interesting features, including what looks like a mistake in one of the brown single blocks. Um, the scalloped edge line that you see 
suggests that this was a piece of fabric that was a second. It was discarded or would have been given away within a mill because that's the edge of the printed cylinder, the cylinder as it went across the fabric to print it, to turn it brown. So is this fabric a second from a mill? Which leads us to ask the question, was this made by someone who worked in a mill at the time who could take the fabric home and then just turn it into a quilt, use it as a quilt? This uh, It could also be a person who just happens to live right? in a mill town, mm -hmm. in a mill community, because um, I this this is exciting to see her talk about this because um, my grandmother grew up in a mill town and her mother would go where they would discard the fabric that was like this and also like they would use it sometimes the ends they used it to clean off the machinery literally like and they they didn't think of this stuff as being very useful because you know it's a second and so they would often throw it out so it I think it's a it's good to hypothesize that it could have been a mill employee but I think it's also it could have just been anybody that lives in a mill town that has access to the mills trash. Mm -hmm. If you look at the floral patterns, you can see that there are at least two different colorways there, which again suggests this particular quilt was made by somebody who could gather together seconds from a from their place at which they worked and uh, take it home and make a, a quilt out of it. So the unfinished quilts can be as fun as the finished ones. This uh, is one of three English paper pieced quilts tops that we have at the university, all from the same family. And the papers inside date from the late 1700s through to the 1930s. Um, the unfinished tops have on the front of them fabrics that date from probably the 1830s, but then also into the 1930s as well. So we believe that the unfinished quilts were begun in Charleston, South Carolina, brought back to Rhode Island, and then another family member started to take them apart, put them back together and such in the 1930s. They came to us in the 1950s. There's a really interesting history to this piece, and it's shown on the back of the quilt. Why quilts are made? Well, sometimes we know, sometimes we don't know. The pocket that you can see on the left was certainly made for convenience. And it's a lovely little pieced bit of um, patchwork, not quilted, but certainly um, has a lovely variety of printed cottons onto it. The quilt in the middle was made by a woman who we know uh, sewed for a living after her husband uh, she made this quilt early in the 1860s she married her husband went off to war the civil war and never came home and she supported herself partly by sewing for people the quilt on the right is a baby quilt latter part of the 19th century it is small um, it's appliqued as well as pieced i'm not quite sure i would want to put a baby on it we do know that it was made for a baby, but it really is more in celebration, perhaps something practical to use for a baby. But that, in some ways, is just my opinion. The word quilt is quite interesting because it is both a noun and a verb. Quilts yeah, I wouldn't put a baby on that have uh, been used. Would you say? I wouldn't put a baby on that quilt. No. <laughs> Babies are liable to have, uh, you know, sticky fingers, snot, barf. <laughs> <laughs> One would wonder, is that maybe the the reason why it's scrappy? Yeah. To, if it, yeah. If I could throw it in the washer and dryer, different story, but. <laughs> to cover beds. They've been used to um, provide perhaps something for friends that are traveling distances. We all know about signature quilts and how they can be made by a group of people. If somebody is moving away or to celebrate a birth or a wedding, something such as that, they certainly can be displays of um, a person's technical abilities. It could be ways to relieve stress. I mean, think of the ways that people use quilting today to become artistic, to create things, to have something to do with their hands. 
Quilts can be made from published designs, and those started in the latter part of the 19th century in uh, women's publications, such as Godey's Ladies Book. It can be individual works of art as well. Quilts are just um, such a way to express oneself and to learn about people in the way that they express themselves. Many things affect quilt making, the technology, of course, we all know about the uh, invention of the cotton gin and what that did to the, the manufacturing gin. of cotton products in this country <laughs> early in the 19th century. Technology also includes such things as the dyeing processes. 1856, the development of the first synthetic dye in England opened up a whole new world of colors in the 19th century. Economic Wait a minute. This picture of this boat are those all cotton bales? You know, I was thinking that as soon as she flipped to that slide, um, it, gosh, it kind of looks like it. Either that or that's like a, a <laughs> I don't know. Well, otherwise it looks like a riverboat made out of stone. Like I have, that's what I was gonna they're say. all looks... cotton bales. Which... I think they are. I think that's what that's and supposed that's to be. And that's a riverboat, right? Because I see the, um, the steam you know, I don't see the wheel, but yeah, that literally looks like it's all cotton bales. I've never seen a photo. Yeah, like Mario Dim is saying, yes, there are cotton bales and they look like it to me. Oh yeah, it's no, they totally look like it. Cause it's, it's crazy definitely not stone. That... <laughs> it's crazy to think that they have all that. Well, I mean, a cotton bale is not light. It, I mean, that is still something that is quite heavy once that's all compressed. Um, but yeah, it's crazy to me that they have it like stacked up like that. I'm wondering if this is a little bit of... Um, the dramatization <laughs> right robin i'm wondering if it's a little bit of artistic you know like well you know. but when you think about it when they were hauling up cotton from the south to the north for the mills mm -hmm. i mean i don't they needed know a lot of cotton yeah i don't know how far a cotton bill would go in terms of making i mean i'm sure that answer is out there in the world somewhere but um you'd need a lot because there were also a lot of mills up here at the time once things really got going so interesting very interesting yeah i got amara de missing navarro county texas is still cotton country so oh yeah um what i was gonna say though about this is um it, it's so interesting that she's you know talking about this it's it's such a important piece of this um you know i mean fiber and all of the things that come out of fiber so like the whole whole idea of like the textile like industry or the textile craft I mean, you can take it back like to the beginning of time for humans, basically, um, and and really nitpick it down to, you know, like the the whirls, you know, that I can't remember the the um the spinning um wheel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? The little oh, the drop, the drop, drop spindle. Yeah. Yeah, the drop spindle, the little the whirl. That thing, um, you know, like that goes back to million millions but many many years bc let's put it that way like very old antiquity and i mean that's a piece of technology and you know she's she's talked about all this other stuff we've got the cotton gin and i mean that was important to the economics of cotton we've got synthetic dyes um but i mean again you can go back like wars are waged over cotton united states i mean this this little quote she has from the senator a senator from south carolina uh 1858 well yeah no power on earth dares make war of cotton well guess what buddy <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it's gonna have a factor in the civil war coming up real soon in your world um and they're they're just i mean like jacquard weaving informed computers you know like there's all of this this I mean, this is why I love textiles, because they are so enmeshed with our culture. So, I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of material culture studies you can do that have nothing to do with quilts, but you're going to get into these topics just because of the way things affect each other. Mm -hmm. Factor as well. Politics also, as a senator from South Carolina said in 1858, no power on earth dares make war on cotton. Cotton is king. We all know what happened after that. After that, all of these things affect manufacturing quilts, making the making of quilts today, making of quilts in the 19th century. Quilts are multi-layered. They are 
utilitarian as well as um, can be looked on as a kind of artwork. This whole cloth quilt that we have in our collection is simply perhaps utilitarian, but someone took the time to um, express their creativity in the quilting pattern, which is again on point, just like the pieced patterns, the blocks that you see in Rhode Island quilts, goes on point. It's a geometric pattern. It's not just straight lines. This consideration of an artifact brings the people who made and used quilts really to life. When you look at a quilt through a material culture study, it goes beyond just what it looks like. Is it pretty? Is it this, that? It goes into looking at the time and the place in which it was made. And then last thing to do when you look at a material culture study and you look at a quilt from various ways is to think about how the quilt, what it means to you today. There are a lot of resources, a lot of articles on quilting. Um, you could go to such places as JSTOR. The quilt index includes all of the descriptive elements needed for looking at a material culture study. So it asks those questions such as what are the dimensions? What are the blocks? How is it made? Da, 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 da. And you can go to that through uh, just Googling the quilt index. It's a wonderful resource as well for looking up um, comparisons, for looking up lots of different information about how quilts um, can uh, have different characteristics depending upon where they're made and such, the time period in which they're made. The American Quilt Study Group, we do a lot of wonderful things, which is why I'm here. The quilts that you saw are all at the University of Rhode Island. We have a historic textile and costume collection, and you're welcome to um, contact the university for more information. And finally, this is just a little bit, this is just a few of the books that you might want to um, look for in order to learn a bit more about quilts quilts, history, um, the textiles used in quilting and such. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon. That was so great. Yeah. And, um, I guess this month, right? In a week or two, we should be seeing the next one drop. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's. I think that the the cadence is set as the last Thursday of every month. I think. Um, but anyway, Susie's um, Susan's next one will will be coming out, and she's kind of doing like a part two because she said she knew <laughs> she had so much to talk about with material culture. She you know, it would be a really long video if she, she tried to put it all in there. So mm -hmm. um, her part two will come out and I can't wait. You know, I, like I said, I get the gist of material culture. I understand. I mean, it's, it's what we're doing when we're investigating a quilt, um, you know, whether it's our own personal family quilt or something that we purchased or something that we're just interested in looking at. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there are kind of those, cause I'm not an academic, um, so I've, I kind of always have that question in my mind, like, am I doing this right? <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, yes, yes. When we look at quilts, we're doing it right. But, um, I'm just eager for more information from Susie. I mean, essentially Susan Jerome is a professor. So you just got like a little 20 minute clip of what the kind of stuff she teaches in her classes and the kind of well, lectures that she does. And now I'm just sitting here like University of Rhode Island is not that far away from me. Like. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should maybe I should call her up and and go pay her a visit um because she's Susan Jerome's also just lovely if you're mm -hmm. doing any kind of research that that you think reaching out to her would be to your benefit she's a wonderful person to to talk to yeah she definitely is and I I had the pleasure of hanging out with her at QuiltCon um so I, I learned more about, um, you know, her personally and, and she really is, she's a great person, very lovely, always willing to help. And, um, like I said, I'm so excited to hear more and her experience is really interesting because she's not just quilt. She's also costume mm -hmm. and that like my, my heart 
just <laughs> seeings when I can look at both things, you know? Mm -hmm. So her knowledge is, is really fun. And you know, there's a, there's a number of, of folks, um, typically academics who are in the new England area that, um, you know, have been connected either with universities or like historic sites, um, that do both costume and, um, and quilt. So I, I love to look at their videos and their information because it's like double the fun and, and double the information. And then it's kind of exciting to see the overlaps too, you know? Well, and, and those two things are so in like, just inherently connected. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, absolutely. it's like you almost can't study one without the other in some mm -hmm. way, shape or form. Um, because well, both of those things were such an inherent part of women's lives <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, altogether. Like, yeah, yeah, I immediately think of Lynn Bassett and her quilted petticoat. Well, and, yeah. Lynn Bassett was one person I was thinking of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Stephanie and I, um, are supposed to be working on one to drop later in the year, um, related to, uh, working with museums, like Stephanie's side of being the outsider coming into work with a museum and, me from the being inside and what's available to people on the outside kind of thing that we're putting together, which there's so much to talk about and so much to share. Uh, we got to figure out how to get it down to 20 minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that means like 10 minutes a person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, and we all know I can fill up 20, I can fill up two hours just talking about nothing. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's really going to have to, narrow that down a, a lot a lot yeah. well you know I mean while we have a few people here is there anything that you guys have ever wondered about museums you know as far as looking at things in museums I mean I, that uh I mean if you got something off the top of your head now put it in the chat box um but definitely let us know if there's something that you know as people who are interested in in the stuff that we we investigate and and talk about um you know, if there's something about museums that you've always wondered, if we don't know the answer, we can find it and put it in our talk. Yeah, I'm just trying. My, I guess my biggest side of things would be things that museums might have that you don't know that they have. Like I, the number of people that do not know that New England Club Museum has a library that's open mm -hmm. to the public um, is... A lot of people. <laughs> um, most people come in. I didn't know you guys had this, mm -hmm. and um, you know the fact that it's a lending library. If you're a, a member of the museum, almost nobody knows about that. Um, or even I feel like you know, like from your side of working with uh, museums during your Dunn research, like I think people are often intimidated to mm -hmm. uh, reach out yeah, to museums, sure. thinking, thinking especially if you're not an academic. I'm not. I'm not part of a group that's privy to go in and work with a museum. And that's just not true. So um, some mm -hmm. museums obviously can be more difficult to deal with than others, um, often due to staffing and things like that. But generally speaking, like you, you don't have to be pedigreed, you know, to go in and, and work mm -hmm. yeah. with the collection. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we don't want to reveal too many of the secrets. <laughs> before we can put our, our presentation together. But yeah, we're, I'm definitely excited about that because, you know, two years ago, I definitely was like, oh my gosh, I wish I could get into museums and look at stuff. And then I got the opportunity, Susan Jerome asking me, so do you want to do a study center about this? Please submit. And I'm like, I have to get in the museum. Oh. <laughs> So thank goodness I, I worked that out so I can, I can tell that story. Mm -hmm. And now yeah. like, I, I feel like, like your BFFs with a couple of museums now. Yeah. You know, I mean, definitely um, because I, I did a majority of my research at the Baltimore Museum of Art and I've kind of gotten to know the library and archivist there and she's, you know, we're, we're friendly enough that I can ask her questions and she'll give me kind of the lowdown on things. And, um, it's nice to have that relationship, um, you know, just to know that I can reach out to her and, and she'll kind of inform me <laughs> about stuff and, and also give me that, that inside information that you kind of just don't know, mm -hmm. you know, like, and every museum is a little bit different too. So it's important to cultivate those relationships with people when you connect with them. 
absolutely. Um, so we still have a, a, a little bit of time here. Yeah. Um, so I have something ready to just peruse real quick. Okay. If you, if you are interested. Sure. Absolutely. So... Anytime I don't have to do the work <laughs> on my own stream. <laughs> Well, I figured, you know, something you've got, you've got the dual stream for anyone that came in late. We are streaming currently on Cool Nerding's YouTube and Stephanie's uh, Twitch account um, so that everybody gets to see stuff. But I figure we shouldn't have you touch anything because you got this perfect ecosystem working over there. So yes, God forbid it is streaming in both places. Let's not, let's not mess with that. Yeah. So, so whatever, yeah, whatever I, you'd like to share. Well, I figured since we're going to... Um, oh no worry mama it's so good to see you thank you so much for stopping by and for for bringing your folks uh um, I i'll thought, catch you soon i thought since we were gonna do dana's auction on saturday a little, maybe, preview, a little yeah, preview maybe we'd like check things out a bit because i'm 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 not gonna lie i haven't perused as deeply <laughs> as maybe you have um and I did peek like super quick before we got on our stream and was like wow there's some really cool mm -hmm. stuff in here um so I thought we could we could look at that like you know what's funny is so you know in New England you find a lot of quilts with the um bedpost cutouts but it's like a mm -hmm. whole chunk cut out I right. look at that here, one just got the little circles yeah the little tiny uh -huh. posts um even like oh my god this hexagon mosaic is really gorgeous and um dana is also she's start her start bits here are really low um and you can get yourself like if you think oh they're quilts oh it's an auction i i couldn't possibly afford anything um that's not true like you you can really get some good deals and dana's shipping is also very reasonable mm -hmm. um I think it, what is it like 20, is it like $20 for one quilt and only $5 like, for each additional, something like that? It's 20 or 25 and yeah, mm -hmm. $5 for each additional. Um, yeah. Like, and you know, I mean, yes, Jill's absolutely right. Dana's got low starting points, et cetera, but also don't be fooled by those $10. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> the day of, I, I, I am surprised that this close to the start date that there aren't like obviously this one's got a it's been bid up um with the pre-bids but i'm actually surprised some of those don't have pre-bids on them yet or they've just got the ten dollar pre-bid um because some of these often and i feel like she kind of she front loads the auction with like the super expensive stuff <laughs> Like the stuff that she knows is going to bring, like you can see the estimated price here is a thousand to two thousand dollars. Well, and notice that too, is not her, her buyer's premium is pretty reasonable. Yeah, what, it's eighteen percent. But um, yeah. uh, there was one, there was one auction that you and I were bidding in where the buyer's premium was like twenty nine percent or some jazz Something like, like that. that. Yeah. Um, I I see some that have thirty, like. It's yeah, really and that's funny. like you know when it gets up that high, you're almost like, ugh. even this, if you get a quilt for a deal, yeah, <laughs> it's I know. still not a deal because of all of those those fees. This basket is so cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would. I had my eyes on that one because my mother loves basket quilts, and I'm always looking for something fun for you know gifts for her, um, you know birthdays and, and Christmas and stuff. This this album quilt too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one is a really good one. Yeah, that's so pretty. And obviously, like, I'm not, like, going through here and, like, super scrutinizing um, the condition of the quilt. Because far away, anything looks fabulous. And then you go, oh, it's missing stuff. But just looking at the 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 initial stuff here, here we got more red work embroidery, which we had recently been talking a bunch about. That cut um, work quilt is amazing is which one up here 16 lot number 16 yeah mm -hmm. this one almost looks to me like just a piece of fabric in its yes I mean think think about like yes <laughs> the digital printed things like that I mean it does mm -hmm. look very modern in that aspect um I guess I don't even know what to call that but it was mean? that kind of sort of lacy looking kind of things like I realize this is like that's cut work as um 
I don't know if this would be from Pennsylvania, but it's typically like the Sharon Schnitt. This one says oh, Vermont. The, does it say Vermont? Oh, duh, BT. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's typically what that cut work is. If it's you know, the, this but this is like really intricate. Mm-hmm. Pretty amazing. Some of the star stuff down here, like look at this, like in all the like those tiny. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. I, I really like Starburst stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, since my business logo is is the Starburst of a quilt I have in my collection, um, there's a couple of, like, look at this one. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Like, to make one of these stars by hand. And yeah, it's, it's all a of that. Yes. Then to make yeah. a bunch of small ones to go with it. I, I mean, it'd be a wonder I could survive the big star. <laughs> let alone a bunch of little ones yeah I mean those are even challenging from a modern perspective you know even with because there's techniques that you can do to make those now that yeah, like strip you know, and cut you're using, yeah you're using a rotary cutter and you know you're matching points and stuff but yeah to have made them by hand yeah because bias <laughs> yeah even now like you said with with modern tools bias is bias is bias so mm -hmm. like that can be obnoxious on its own and then doing it all by hand piece by piece and then of course we've got one of your paragon kits mm -hmm. i know <laughs> um are you are you eyeballing a paragon kit there i may i may be <laughs> my you know you asked me the other day what is my unicorn my unicorn is the older paragon eagle mm -hmm. i've missed it twice now Dana has actually had two of them come up for auction over the past year, and I missed both of them. Yeah, I was going to say, I've seen at least two. This one's interesting. This one's Cactus Pot, but it looks, I mean, I could see why it would be Cactus, but from far away, it looked totally just basket to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't um, know that's what that was called. I didn't either. Um, but I mean, I, yeah, I can, I can see it. I can see it. And then here we've got some kind of a, a 1930s kit. Mm -hmm. That actually has, it's, I don't think it is, but it's kind of got Marie Webster vibes. Oh, vibes to it? Well, yeah. let me see if I... I don't think, I don't think it is one of hers, but it definitely has. It did, yeah, I can see what you're talking about. It definitely has some mm -hmm. vibes. Oh, wait. Can I zoom that in? Yeah, I can't see what Dramatic Rose. Just, oh, it just says Dramatic Rose. It's just that particular quilt has been published. <laughs> yeah, I That's was hoping. The, that is what I can say. That is the beautiful thing about auction houses like Dana, who there she's, she's, this is possibly a lot of these quilts are out of one person's collection. And mm -hmm. so they will have those like provenance type of things or the, you know, where has this quilt been seen before? How many hands has this quilt passed through? Like, she's got that kind of stuff documented in these. Um, you don't wow, always find this, that when you just go out and buy a quilt. This star is really cool. Mm -hmm. Twinkling star, 1880. Hmm. Yeah, it looks very scrappy. Like, from a distance, it. Oh, it's... yeah. There you go. But yeah, up close, it's really scrappy. I like that. Mm. my my purse is crying right now oh look <laughs> there's the sunbonnet so i know oh my gosh is nobody even nobody's even done a pre-bit on it well wow it looks like not and these are wow, the little these are um, cute ones yeah this is the little lady i actually have a quilt that's that's her um i think i bought it from you <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, um, but I feel yeah, like these the little, ladies are even lady scrappier. Mm -hmm. And um, I like that checkerboard. Yeah, around I the can't, border. Can I zoom in? Oh, I can. I, mm -hmm. I don't think you can. I think that you can only oh, do like stinks. the pop out and then back in. That stinks because I was gonna say it doesn't look like there's. Oh, is it signed? Yeah, it looks like it's signed. Let's see. Oh so, yeah, it is. Um, what does it say? Nineteen. This is 19, she's saying like circa 1930s. Hmm. Um, this one's from Bobby Og. 
cute, cute, cute. This is like a magic eye quilt. Oh, this is a cheater <laughs> print. Is this your cheater print? I don't think so. Wow, that's a very intricate cheater print. Mm -hmm. I would not have expected that print to look so perfectly patchwork-like. Ooh, that's really cute. These baskets down here. I like the way that that's um, laid out. Mm -hmm. And so, excuse me, so far, most of these are not. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I mean, you can see the ones higher. that people are definitely after because they've mm -hmm. already sort of bid them up with the pre-bids. But well, I'm anything, very anything that's got this purple already has a pre-bid on it. Yeah. Um, but even those yeah. pre-bids aren't. If it's say if the highest pre bid is ten dollars, that means only one person has pre bid on it so mm -hmm. far. Well, and you know, my guess is that there are probably like some dealers that will come in and just put pre bids on stuff because if nobody else gets it, then they they can get it. You know, yeah. nobody else bids it up. But um, this is very interesting. This nineteen forties double wedding ring, that's very unique looking. Mm -hmm. I like all these little already. circles. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever seen one like that. I have. I don't think I, think I have it's either. An interesting one. Yeah. This is going to be an interesting auction. <laughs> wow, lots of double wedding ring. Yeah, I. You know, anytime she has, um, she's got quilts and textiles. It's. It's uh, oh, even more. Well, this one people are really excited about. The pickle dish, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with with a high bid of three twenty five, that tells me you probably got at least two people fighting over it. And what's interesting is the estimate is only two hundred to four hundred. So yeah, it's so funny. It, I mean, it really goes to show you yeah. that, like, while obviously auction houses try to you know be good with their estimates, they still can't know for sure. Mm -hmm. You know what what's going to be holy moly and what's not because there are some things out there that I've seen at auctions that go for a buttload and I, I cannot understand why. And then there's well, other and I things think in that some I, cases, yeah, you get like two people that are duking it out and I have know, definitely and like... been in a couple of those <laughs> nights. Um, but yeah. And, or then you just get like the perfect owner of that quilt happens to not be here. And so it just doesn't get bid on or, it, you know, gets a minimum bid. Wow, this one's a double wedding ring, but from far away, it looks like a star. Because it's super scrappy. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it has something to do for me with the background. The background mm -hmm. blends into some of the fabric instead of being right, a high, yeah. high contrast. Um, yeah, I don't know that I've ever seen so many double wedding ring quilts in one place. This one's really pretty, well, too. Well, if those all happen to be... Because I know sometimes, I mean, they're like the the like a bunch of the quilts will be from the one, you know, the collector that she's advertising, Bobby Og. But sometimes she's got other stuff she's filling in there with from her inventory. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say my guess is Bobby Og was a or is I'm not sure if this is a from an estate or um, that she's offered these up. But interesting, um, a goblet quilt. Yeah, I saw that the other day when I was scrolling through. That was something I hadn't seen before. But my yeah. guess is Bobby Og might have been a uh, double wedding ring quilt collector. <laughs> oh, maybe. Um, I like this scrappy one here too. Yeah, those always catch my eye. Yeah, I love I love a good orphan black. Oh my goodness, look at the star. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that a lot. Like and there's the a few one. instances in here, and especially as you move on, where she's offering two quilts for each auction yeah. lot. Yeah. And I think sometimes those are like where they're not in as super, super duper good shape. You know, mm -hmm. they might have a few more flaws than. Mm -hmm. Collide. Oh, this one was made by Bobby Og. Oh, oh, oh quite a few of these were. Interesting. Actually, you know what? While you're scrolling, I'm gonna look and find out who is Bobby Og. Yeah, because as I say, it's yeah. not it's not someone I'm familiar with. And there's quite a few here made by 
Oh, Carol Breyer Fowler, too. Mini quilt. Another one, it looks like Mary's story. I don't know who that is either. So some here are contemporary quilts. So I am thinking that Bobby Og. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So this these are the estate of Bobby Og. It sounds like she passed away this year. Mm -hmm. um, but up until recently, she was um, in some videos and... Um, she did some stuff through um, AQSG. Mm -hmm. Or no, I'm sorry. AQS. This is not AQSG. This is AQS. Um, but yeah, Quilt Care. She wrote some books. Um, price Guide to Functional and Fashionable Cloth Comfort. <laughs> huh. uh, Charm Quilts with Style. Yeah, so she wrote a number of books. And so it looks like she just passed away this year. So this these must be from her from her estate. These are, this is going to be a very interesting auction. The, some doll quilts, a group of three antique doll quilts. Someone is very interested in that so far. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. I, the, I had, those hadn't been bid on last time I looked. So, Oh, we've got quite a, quite a bit here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd forgotten that there was a number of these little small, um, small quilt groups. Yeah, some of them are, it looks like some are antique and some are modern. Mm-hmm. I like the little display for them. For animal themed quilts, that butterfly is really cool. Look at the kitty. Yeah. You know, we looked at doll quilts the other day. So mm -hmm. um, I've got doll quilts on my mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. This one here is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think all of those are newer contemporary. Yeah, contemporary quilts. It'll be interesting to see what the contemporary quilts go for because I feel like there is kind of a, a a whole host of of people that don't necessarily find them as valuable as antique quilts mm -hmm. or yeah mm. or just not interested in them. But I look, you know, I look at contemporary quilts from the perspective of, you know, does it catch my eye and why? Why does it catch mm -hmm. my eye? In the same way that a like an antique or vintage quilt, like why why am I looking at this and going <gasps> <laughs> you know what is it about it that is is enticing to me and then we've got antique fabric oh no it's mm -hmm. repro sorry it's repro but uh, i do think that she has some antique fabric in there i think lots of orphan quote blocks yeah um, lots grouping. of stuff wow and mm -hmm. for those of us like myself that like a good orphan block quilt like mm -hmm. this right here wow you got a whole a whole honk of them these ones over here these oak leaf ones are really cool too mm -hmm. yeah those aren't very nice looking we've got patterns tons of blocks wow mm -hmm. i feel like this is the, the like in this blocks too this is a place where you could really get a deal um with these mixed lot kind of things yep oh look at these little patchwork collars oh yeah i saw those little, i was like best. <laughs> and I think those are vintage, right? Does it say antique or vintage? Yeah, antique. antique. Um, it's so funny, you know, Mary, when Mary Fonz did, you know, her quilt clothing must die <laughs> a couple years ago. Um, it was a controversial video, but she talked about the, the collars, like the mm -hmm. patchwork collars. And some of them, I, I got to be honest, I don't know that I would necessarily wear something like that. You know, I mean, I, I love a big collar. I love a statement piece, but I also don't like to look like a clown, <laughs> but you know, so she kind of was, she kind of, she kind of trashed the, the quilt collars, but my gosh, they were making them a long time ago too, I guess, mm -hmm. if this is, if this is accurate, an antique collar. So mm. this is a chance. What are these Bobby Og antique fabric reference books? Yes. And so oh. there's like a whole, there's two sets of those. And then um, I think as we get further to the end, there's um, more fabric. Ooh. Oh my gosh. I never opened this one to look at. Look at that. Actually got pieces. Yeah. She's got pieces of fabric in there. Ah. Oh my. 
I have a feeling there'll be some fighting over this stuff. Yes. <laughs> that a centennial print? Absolutely. Yeah. Look, I've never seen this centennial print. Yeah. I, have, I haven't I seen I currently have a quilt for sale with this centennial print right here. Um. Wow. And also, you know who has centennial prints right now is um Julia Kelly Houdinas. Her site is PK Truve, and she has all her centennial prints like 50% off for the month of July. Just FYI um that is really cool let's look at the other set here also to have these as a set i half of me is like hmm maybe i want to have listed these <laughs> all separately uh, oh mm -hmm. <coughs> oh my god look at yeah, that yeah i thought these were conversation print. yeah i think these are pretty darn cool there's the infamous pink <laughs> the double pink yeah, these are really neat. Hmm. 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 Yeah, me thinks there's going to be some fights over those two. Those two yeah. lots. Yeah. Lots of great antique fabric, loose fabric collection. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff in here. Look at this crazy quilt. Mm hmm. Ooh, I like the edge. And see, I don't. I'm like, oh, things with ruffles and edges. Although this little, this little guy behind me has. I don't know that I ever really showed this off. I bought it when I was in California. It's got this silky red. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm assuming it is actually silk. It feels like actual real silk. Um, but yeah, it's got this hmm. like, silky red ruffle. Hmm. <laughs> There's Very actually. Blah. When I was at the New England Coal Museum the other day taking pictures for us to look at, it's so funny. I was in Pam's office talking to her and literally she gets off her, someone calls her, she gets off her phone. She goes, come downstairs with me. There was a woman bringing in quilts, two crazy quilts for the museum to be sold while I was there. Ooh. And one of them has a very interesting green finish ruffle type thing to it let's see vintage sewing notions um mm -hmm. more blocks some wood block textile printing stamps i got one of those Ooh, this is pretty this crib quilt here the leaves and berries well these are really pretty too the two tops there's really something for everybody in this sale isn't there yep for sure. Look at these doggies. I know those little doggies are so cute. Yeah, and here's all of the actual antique uh, fabrics, fabric balls stuff. and the centennials and stuff. Well, I can somebody's probably gonna be busy shopping the sale for all the twalls. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um patriotic we, textiles. Yeah, really nice, nice stuff mm -hmm. here. American baby rose kit quilts. Mm -hmm. look look that's yeah. interesting uh-huh all right i can't zoom in <laughs> yeah i know i was like eh. shucks i could if i was on my phone it's one thing i like about that pinch you know pinching open mm -hmm. yeah Pretty so here's the swatch books oh yeah no. i think that's what the rest of it is of these swatch books and i think these are left over from um like she split them into two separate groups and she had a lot of these in a previous auction and i think they're from it's some some place in new york it's some textile place in new york i guess that um now i wonder why these don't look very popular like how come these haven't been you know there's there's no pre-bid on this yeah i don't know hmm somebody knows that mia wants them probably i don't know <laughs> <laughs> our our friend mia she has like the mother of all and i believe she got it from a dana auction um i mean the book is like this thick it's probably oh yeah it's huge it might as well be a literal family bible yeah i mean it is huge and it's it was put together by one person right i mean it was it's not from a textile archive it was it was built by a person 
So here's one for like silks and cottons. So like, is it, mm -hmm. is it like a whole book or is it pieces of a book? I think they're I like, they're, 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 yeah, they're, they've got multiple pages and, and such, but they're not like huge. And it's, it's like all these different colorways of, hmm. yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I'm really going to have, so, and this is the auction that we're going to, um, Indeed it is. that we're going to stream on Saturday. So mm -hmm. huh, some of these actually yep. have, oh, they're from the 1970s. I was going to say they actually still have the distributor on them. Yeah, I want to say yeah. There, there's one that one from the seventies. I was eyeballing that because I do this have one up here? some of those. Yeah, I do have some of the um. There are some fashion industry magazines um that would have pieces of fabric in them, mm -hmm. and so I have a number of them from the sixties and seventies. Um, just to, I mean, you know, it, it's hard to date polyester. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but you know one can try wow that was that's quite that is quite a fabric collection mm -hmm. um yep wow wow so something to look forward to you guys so we'll be watching that on uh saturday which i guess this is a good segue before i leave just a reminder we'll not be streaming on thursday because we're going to stream we're going to do a co-stream on saturday of this particular auction while it's live We'll get started at 11 a.m. on Saturday. So, um, well, it's a little after four. We made it. <laughs> yes, it's time for my midday Monday responsibilities. <laughs> I need to go. Um, I need to go eat food. Yeah, I didn't have a chance to grab some lunch before this. I'm a little peckish myself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so uh, hopefully you're you're joining us tomorrow to as we finish off Crazy Quilts. Uh, and that will be on YouTube on the Quilt Nerding stream. On Wednesday on the Quilt Nerding stream on YouTube, we will be doing um, Needlework Nights, the paper needle books. Mm -hmm. um, I will be canceled on Thursday. I'll be canceled. I am canceling Thursday <laughs> to stream on Saturday. And do not forget Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern is my textile talk, which I'm sharing with the other Artist James scholars. So um, hope to see you there too. Yeah, everybody, we got to show up that, there. We got to show you know, up there in that, the chat to, yeah. to lend our support to Stephanie. One other thing to just mention before we head off is if um if you have been, since we've been talking about American Cold Study Group while we're here today, if you have been considering attending seminar, joining AQSG, and, and you feel like you just like want a little more info before you take the dive, we did a live stream on the Quilt Nerding channel with uh, the executive director, Carrie Dell, as our guest. And we went through the whole shebang, all the things that are included, um, you know, up on the screen. We even went through the uh, the sign up process. We were even given a coupon code for people that want to join. That is seminar twenty four in all caps, and that gives you fifteen dollars off uh, a new uh, membership, which is good through August fifth, twenty twenty four. For anyone that's watching this in twenty twenty six, and. Uh, the registration closes August 5th. So if you've been considering, now's the time to take the plunge. And Stephanie and I will be there so you get to come hang out with us. Yeah. And I'm putting in, <clears throat> I'm putting the link into that video. Well, unfortunately, the YouTube chat is not working for me. But that's all right. I It'll be, I'll, I'll stick it into the description later. Yeah. If you're watching us through YouTube, you already know where to find us. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so well with that i will say adieu thank you guys so much as always we appreciate you so much and uh, thank you yeah we love our buddies so have a wonderful evening and afternoon and we will see you tomorrow hopefully Alrighty, everybody don't know bye, bye. <laughs>